I think the first thing I want to say is thanks for being here today. Uh, this is an amazing crowd of people in the room. I remarked earlier to Bruce, this really feels like a family reunion more than, than like a conference. And I, I personally really appreciate you being here today. So why on earth did we have the idea to start a new networking conference? Right? And for me personally, um, I think the answer is, I think networking is currently going through a very profound change, right? That if you look at the big picture, is driven by how the whole IT industry is adapting to the cloud, right? And uh, you know, if I, if I use the word cloud networking, uh, the predictable reaction is gonna be that that sounds like the ultimate buzzword, right? But, but let me sort of make a very practical example of, of how I think networking in the future will be different, right? Um, I have three kids, you know, eight, six, and three. Uh, so on a weekend when I'm trying to work, that doesn't quite work at home. Uh, so I usually go to the Starbucks uh, uh, down the road. And um, you know, when, I'm, when I'm sitting at the Starbucks, for example, working on an, on an Amazon demo, right, and you do a little packet trace, you know, it goes from, from the Starbucks you know, access point via Comcast, which seems to be their provider, you know, up, to, um, up to Amazon. Um, Baskar Iyer is a gentleman who's the CIO of VMware. Right? If you look at that packet trace, there's not a single switch or router, obviously, that is under his control, right? They're all controlled by different entities. That being said, if because of me working at Starbucks, you know, and on that Amazon demo, there's a major data breach at VMware, he will probably still get fired, right? And that for me really is the, the new reality of networking, that you have to suddenly create networks where the hardware is no longer owned by you, right? Which is, I think, really changing um, how we're doing networking. And the other really interesting trend is that it used to be you had one networking team that was, you know, like nicely siloed, that was basically controlling all of your network. And if you go into a, a, a you know, modern enterprise today, you suddenly see, you know, you have uh, container developers that want to basically create a little container overlay, you know, for a couple of Kubernetes containers or Docker or, or Pivotal, uh, just, a, just a VX LAN mesh. They want to drive networking for that with, you know, how the load balancer is configured, how, you know, what, what firewall ports are open, you know, what the logical subnet they're creating. And then you have the IT folks that want to connect those microservices to virtual machines and to bare metal um, um, workloads, and then you want to looking at the bigger picture. And you may, underneath, you have yet another layer of, of, uh, of uh, tunnel overlay, you know, where somebody, for example, is using ACI um, to build a fabric, right? So suddenly, we're having multiple constituents in that are all trying to influence how we do networking in an organization, right? And I think that, that really changes the, the discipline of networking. So, you know, at a networking event today, uh, I personally think it's as important to have an Amazon or an Azure or a Google represented, or, or maybe have a Docker or a Pivotal uh, or a Mesosphere, um, you know, or a Kubernetes represented as it is to have traditional hardware switches. And so with that, you know, we, we started FutureNet, and uh, I want to hand it over to the person who was probably the main instigator behind this and uh, you know, has done uh, at least 10 times as much work making this happen here. Please welcome Bruce Davy. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Guido, for the introduction. Uh, so people often wonder what's the difference between Guido's job and my job, because we have almost the same title, different only in one word. Um, and uh, the, the difference is that you know, Guido can get up and give a talk about vision, and I'm going to talk to you about logistics. So I, I think my... Uh, you know, my two main contributions for you know, the year 2016 are A, organizing this conference, and B, getting Open vSwitch moved over to the Linux Foundation. So I feel pretty good about my... my <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so the, you know, when we had the idea of coming up with this event, uh, you know, the technical sort of thinking was very much as Guido described it, and we uh, also felt you know, we had to get those sort of key sort of innovative networking vendors represented, but we also wanted it to be very customer driven. And so we really went out and beat the bushes to try to find interesting, sophisticated customers to come and talk about what they're doing with networks. So if you look at the agenda today, you'll see we hit most of, of the people that, that Guido mentioned from the, the vendor side, but we balanced it out with a lot of customers. So I really want to say I thank all the customers who've agreed to come and, and speak, um, and also all of those of you who are customers, maybe, or may or may not be current VMware customers, but people we think of as the people who ultimately consume networking products and services. Uh, we, it's really great, we have a great mix in, in the audience. Um, so this is very much sort of the alpha version of this event. And uh, I had this actually the experience 
earlier this week that I kind of did the alpha version of my talk on Monday and the beta version on uh, on Tuesday, and I guess it'll be ready for GA sometime next year. But the uh, the this is the alpha version of this conference, and we really want your feedback on how we can make it better. You know, so as you, you sort of sit here and hear these talks, you know, think about does the format work? Should it be bigger? Should it be more or less exclusive? Um, anything that you want to give us feedback on, we're open to it. We do have aspirations to make this an annual event. Um, for reasons that Guido described, we feel that this is a, a need that isn't getting met by the current sort of slew of networking conferences that are out there. And so we want to figure out what, where should we go with this? You know, should we go bigger? Should we you know, mix up the agenda? Um, but that's something you can have input on. So thanks for being part of this experiment. And uh, hopefully nothing goes horribly wrong in the next two days. Um, there will be a survey at the end uh, handed out sometime tomorrow. Um, and you know, if you're not around tomorrow, you'll still be able to send us feedback by you know, par carrier pigeon or whatever. And uh, there will be a prize for filling out your survey. Uh, so on to some more practical matters. Uh, so first of all, we, we established a pretty all-star steering committee based on our, uh, basically our personal social network, but also trying to make sure we represented the, the, the customers, the vendors from the, the cloud side, from the, the container side, and a few of the sort of traditional sheet metal bending uh, networking types. Um, so you know, thanks to all of our steering committee, um, you know, not all of whom, but many of whom are here today. Um, without them, we certainly couldn't have put together such an interesting agenda. So maybe a, a quick uh, round of applause for the steering committee. And a very good looking bunch as well, I would say. Um, and then you know, the agenda, you've probably mostly seen it available online. It, I think there's paper copies sitting on the tables as well. Um, so I'm not going to go over this in great detail, but that's what we have coming up today. Um, I'll be back on stage at the end of the day to talk about how you get off to the party and that kind of important stuff. Um, but you know, you'll see you know, a few things here around the, to the topics that Guido mentioned around clouds, around next generation networking, and so on. I do want to draw your attention to a couple of things for tomorrow. So I expect to be pretty hungover tomorrow morning, and I hope many of you will be as well. Um, and so we, uh, we have breakfast with packet pushers. And I'm sure most of you have heard of packet pushers podcast at some point. Um, I will say that, that my experience of being a guest on, just once on Packet Pushers was so much fun that I thought, wouldn't it be great to do the podcast on stage with a live audience and you know, basically do it without a net? So we're going to do that. Um, it's going to be uh, me and Simon Crosby will be the guests of Greg and Ethan on stage, and we're going to run it as a real podcast. We'll record it, put it up online, um, and you'll be all chewing your pastries and drinking gin and tonics or something in the, in the background. Um, and then uh, we have a couple more technical sessions uh, throughout the day. And then uh, finally, at the very end, we're going to have Martin Casado, uh, you know, who I think needs no introduction, and who, who's you know, really one of the visionaries of our industry. Um, he's going to sit up on stage, and we're going to have a chat about where he sees the future of networking. And we're going to make that interactive with the, the rest of the audience. So I hope that you'll stick around till the bitter end tomorrow, even though I'm sure many of us are desperate to get out of Vegas at this point. But it will be worth staying until um, 4.40 when we wrap up tomorrow. Uh, let's see, it, um, more logistical things. Um, if you are a Thursday speaker and we don't yet have your, uh, your slides, we need them. Um, so please uh, go to, to either the speaker check-in area or go find Jenny, who is the master of ceremonies, who's standing or sitting down there. There's Jenny. Um, she is the person who will fix almost any problem. Um, and then Beth is the other person. Uh, maybe you could stand up and wave. Um, Beth is the other person who will fix almost any problem. So if you need anything sorted, um, talk to them. Um, so speakers, please get us your final decks. Um, and uh, that, you know, we, we do obviously want to make it as smooth as possible for all the logistics. Um, speaking of which, uh, we're going to run a pretty tight ship. We've got a very, very full agenda. We were super pleased with how many good quality speakers we were able to attract. We don't have enough time to give everybody a lot of time. So we're going to rigidly keep everybody to 20 minutes. But then we've grouped the speakers into pretty coherent sessions. And at the end of every session, we have an extended Q&A period where we'll have all the speakers from that session up on stage with a moderator. And your job is to get engaged in those discussions. That will be, I think, the most valuable part of the entire event is the interaction between you and the speakers during those Q&A periods. So please stay awake. Don't check email too much during the, the, the talks. Listen to the talks and think about what you want to engage with when the speakers come back up to do that, that Q&A. Um, there will be video recording going on during this event. If you're a speaker and you signed a waiver, it, you just signed away your rights regarding video. Um, if you didn't notice that because you're the sort of person who doesn't read waivers, uh, we can help you out. Just let us know, and we'll make sure your video gets destroyed securely. Um, 
and uh, we will not be recording the Q and A, so you should feel very open to you know say what's on your mind during Q and A. But we do want to um, ha have the videos of the actual presentations because of so many people who wanted to come to this event and couldn't. Um, okay, last couple of things. There is a hashtag for this event because while it was you know, super secret and invitation only, we now want to make people jealous that they're not here. Um, you know, our, our whole idea about keeping it small was we want people to be thinking, I hope I get an invitation next year. So this is your chance to kind of start creating the, the buzz for the future by, by tweeting about it. Um, feel free to Instagram or whatever else. Um, if you're worried about Wi-Fi, you should have figured out by now there's Wi-Fi cards on the, all the tables. It may or may not work, but it's there for those of you who, who suffer separation anxiety. And with that, I think I'm ready to stop being Mr. Logistics um, or Dr. Logistics as I'm known at home. And uh, I will introduce our keynote speaker. So again, a man who really needs very little introduction, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, Nick McEwen is one of the, the true pioneers in the networking industry. Um, I've known him for, I think, 15 years maybe. Um, he was uh, influential in design of some of the early packet switching uh, uh, concepts that ended up in Cisco's routers. Uh, he's done so many successful startups that I've lost track, um, but he did one that I was very pleased that he did, which was Nasira. Um, and it was actually, you know, thanks to a personal connection to Nick that I, I ended up getting recruited to Nasira. And I'd say that worked out reasonably well for, for both of us. Uh, so thanks for that, Nick. Um, and uh, you know, every time I'm, I'm in this position of introducing Nick, I, I sort of start going through all his accomplishments. You know, many of you know at this point that he's not only done many startups, but um, you know, he's, he's been very influential in uh, the research world. He won the SIGCOM award a couple of years ago. So he generally he's the sort of guy who makes me feel pretty inadequate and pretty much a failure in life. But uh, I, I like him quite a lot nevertheless. And uh, you know, he gives a fantastic talk. So I think without any further ado, I'll get out of the way and welcome Nick to the stage. I'm supposed to dance. So when, when, when Bruce um, and Guido invited me to speak today about the future of networking, there was, a, there was a story that I couldn't get out of my mind. And I think it was a story told to me by somebody in the room. A few months ago, a Wall Street bank <coughs> had a big outage in their data center. So what's new? They quickly assembled an emergency team in a conference room. There were two people from compute, two people from storage, two people from networking. The clock was ticking and they were losing millions of dollars per minute. You know how that goes. The compute team was busy writing experiments, collecting data from applications, from hypervisor, from the OS, the CPU. And in the first 30 minutes, they were running experiments that could recreate the problem, isolate it, and fix it. The storage people, they did almost the same thing with a little less visibility. And all the networking people had was ping, traceroute, and SNMP. And that's the same tools they've had for the last 20 years. So when it comes to debugging a network, debugging your network, debugging my network, the following thing says it all. You're on your own, mate. Right? This is something that we all know very well. So I would say that given how rudimentary our tools are in networking, it's not surprising that that networking team had no idea what was going on. In fact, for over an hour, they had no idea. It turns out that it wasn't a networking bug after all, but they weren't able to prove it, and so the finger was pointing at them. And you know that problem well as well, I'm sure. Some companies install a second network to watch the first one. And there's a whole industry just to support that activity. And in fact, the second network often costs more than the first. So stop and think for a moment. What if for every server we had, we had to have another server just to watch it? For every disk, we had to have another disk just to watch what it was doing. The idea is ludicrous. I would say that if we're to build big network systems that actually work and work reliably and work continuously, then we need much, much greater visibility into what the network is doing than we have today down to as fine a granularity as we can possibly manage. I believe it should be a natural part of the way that network systems are built, and it should be a natural part of their normal operation. We should get used to it. And in fact, we should scream bloody murder until it is the case. 
we should be able to examine any packet at any point in the network, the path it took through the network, the state that it encountered on the way, every rule that it matched on, every queue that it visited, how long did it spend in that queue, what else was in that queue, what other packets did it share a queue with? We can do that on a computer, why can't I do that in my network? We kind of know, but do we really know why we can't do that? We know that we would like to. So, I would say we should be able to examine the state for any time period, past or present, and single step through the network, replay all of the events that happened in the past to reproduce the errors so that we could fix them, just like our friends in compute. But that's not all. Next, we need to compare what we're seeing with what the network is supposed to be doing. Again, something that eh, we're not quite sure what it's supposed to be doing. How do we describe what a network does today? We do it in terms of a list of protocols. My network is running IPv4, MPLS, VXLAN. That's not a specification, because all of those protocols are specified in ambiguous English, which is why it's so hard to buy two pieces of equipment that actually talk together correctly. So, we need a clear and unambiguous specification of what the network is supposed to be doing so that we can automatically verify whether the behavior we're seeing is correct. Today, needless to say, we're a long way from this vision. But in keeping with the spirit of this event, I'm gonna be an optimist. The future of networking. So I think this actually gives us a signpost for where we should be heading. And in fact, I'm pretty optimistic. I do think that in future, our network systems are gonna look much more like the computer systems that we're used to today. And so in this talk, I'm gonna try and explain what I mean by all of that. So what does compute have? What am I jealous of that compute has that networking doesn't? I'd like to talk briefly about three things today. Good abstractions. I'd say that we have them for the data plane. We don't yet have them for the control plane. Good programmability, we have it for the control plane, uh, but we don't have it for the data plane. And good visibility, we need to be able to see exactly what our networks are doing so we can keep an eye on them and be able to make sure that we can see what they're doing all the time. So I'm going to claim, and uh, you can invite me back in a, in a while and, and then make me eat my hat if this turns out not to be true. I'm gonna claim that once we have these three things done and checked off and widely used, we're gonna write programs that describe what we want our network to do, probably without ever mentioning a protocol. Our program is gonna be compiled, verified, and run. It will be continuously, automatically verified and tested against our original program, our original specification. If it violates any invariant properties, it's gonna fix itself. It's gonna reboot or it's gonna throw an alarm for a human to intervene. Okay, so let's first talk about good abstractions. And here I'm gonna invoke one of my heroes, Scott Schenker. So Scott Schenker famously said five years ago in his talk, and the talk was the future of networking and the past of protocols, he said, people who run networks today have to keep a superhuman amount of state in their heads, which means networks today are run by masters of complexity. So we've got used to a state of affairs in networking in which it's really hard to observe what the network is doing, and it requires teams of experts with many, many years of experience to be there on premise to understand what's actually going on. Scott went on to say that while we've developed good abstractions for the data plane, uh, we use layers and encapsulation to separate concerns, we haven't yet developed them for the control plane. But if we can make some clever, some clever abstractions, some architectural choices, we'll be able to write control applications without having to worry about the lower layers of the network. That was the basic premise. So let's look to computing. The world of computing is built on a foundation of clever abstractions. The abstraction of virtual memory means our applications don't have to worry about 
what processor we're running on, memory locations, caches. Abstractions for file systems means our applications can open, close, update files without knowing what the hardware is or even where the file system is located. And the abstraction of an operating system is shielding us from how the CPU is scheduling our processes and how peripherals are shared, et cetera. We all know this, we're all very familiar with this, we take it for granted. And as Barbara Liskov said, modularity based on abstraction is the way things are done in computer science. That's what we do, right? That's what the main contributions are of computer science. This is how we, how we build big computers, and in fact, it's how entire data centers are built and run today. To be fair, I actually think that the last 10 years in networking has been all about trying to identify what these abstractions are. That's what all of the debate has been about, particularly for network control planes. You've seen this picture before, but we've been clarifying between us what is the separation of concerns and responsibility between a control plane and a forwarding plane. We don't have to agree, but we can have now have a much more principled discussion about it. In one approach, the control plane is abstracting as a network operating system, a distributed system with the job of maintaining a consistent global view of all of the network state. And on top of this abstraction, we can layer network virtualization, which gives each tenant the illusion of having, having its own physical network with its own private address space. These abstractions are really powerful. They're very, very powerful indeed. They're essentially driving almost all of the innovation that's happening in networking today. So good abstractions not only lead to clear, clean modularity like this, they also make it much easier to verify that a network is being programmed correctly and that it's operating as we'd originally intended it to. So let me explain. I want to explain it by analogy. I'm going to explain it by analogy to how semiconductor chips are made. So I think it's quite telling how different networks are, even though the industry is about the same size. So how do we design, verify, and test chips? Many of you have seen pictures like this before. And as you know, it's really important that when we're designing a chip, we don't make any mistakes. Because if we make a mistake, it can cost us about $10 million. We don't want to be the one that makes that mistake. So the chip industry has developed design automation tools. So we've all seen them that are corresponding to different layers of abstraction. So the, on this picture here is the abstractions that are taught in an introductory VLSI class at Stanford. It's the abstractions involved in the chip design process. At the top is the specification and functional description, which is synthesized down to create a gate level model of the chip. We can formally prove that the two abstractions are equivalent by static checking across boundaries. As we peel away layers of abstractions and get closer and closer to the physical transistors, right at the bottom, we can keep verifying the behavior against the original intent. This industry is big. It's a $10 billion tool business supporting a $250 billion chip industry. What makes all of this possible are multiple layers of abstraction Lots of great tools, lots of great research built on a strong foundation of Boolean algebra. So new abstractions in networking, I think, are gonna make it possible to verify network behavior in a very similar way. Regardless of what the actual abstractions are that we end up with, over the past few years, dozens and dozens of researchers have been creating mathematical foundations, languages, tools, that verify and test correctness of network behavior across these boundaries. I don't have time to go into them here, but I'd be very happy to point you towards languages such as paratic methods to check for, uh, ch check for black holes and loops and new methods for verifying stateful processing in middle boxes. So there's all sorts of work that's going on all about checking across these boundaries. And I predict that new clean abstractions in the control plane is gonna lead to a whole new industry in networking just like the one we have for the chip industry. And you can see activities moving in that direction right now. Okay, next I'd like to talk about good programmability. Programm programmability is an important abstraction in computer systems that we kind of take for granted and we're all very used to today. Nowadays, we take it for granted if we wanted to create a new behavior on our computer. I know we wanna create a spreadsheet program we can write it in a high-level language. 
Uh, in the past, we had to do that in an assembler, but now we can write in a high-level language such as Java or Python without needing to know about the target processor we're writing for. And our code will be portable and target independent. Very important properties. The lower level details of the CPU are hidden and abstracted away from us. We don't have to worry about them. We don't have to worry about memory layout or register allocation. That's all hidden and taken care of by the language and the compiler. So let's contrast this with how network systems are built today. We go to a library, we choose a fixed function switch chip that roughly matches the processing that we want, the feature set that we want. It comes with a data sheet uh, that's written in ambiguous English. And then we have to try and write firmware or code to try and control this chip from a CPU that's sitting next to it. This is very limiting, of course. We can't add new behaviors or remove ones that we don't want. We can't program it to get better visibility into the packets as they go by. We have to live with whatever the chip designer happened to decide to put in. This isn't likely to work well because most of the chip designers that I know don't operate big networks. So in a programmable world, we could decide exactly how packets are processed in the network, top down from a specification of the behavior that we want the network to have. We might simply assemble libraries of existing protocols, or we might have in mind uh, some new super secret, uh, I don't know, source routing idea that, we're, uh, that we wanna try in our network. Either way, I'm gonna compile that behavior down, and then it's gonna run on that, on that forwarding chip. So, now I've defined a system that's top down. I've turned it on its head, just like I do on my computer. So this hasn't happened in the past. Why hasn't it happened in the past? This hasn't happened in the past because there's this conventional wisdom that we've all heard many times, and it says programmable switches or programmable forwarding planes are about 10 to 100 times slower than fixed function switches. And it has some grounding in truth. And it kind of begs the question, couldn't I just use a regular CPU instead? Why can't I just use that? Why have I got this switch chip in the first place? If I want to program its behavior, why don't I just put a CPU? We hear these stories of CPUs getting faster and faster and faster and being better and better at processing packets. Here's a graph of the packet forwarding speeds of single chip switches since 1990. I've been collecting this over the years. This year, the fastest switches will run at 6.4 terabits per second. Now let's contrast that with the fastest reported superhero experiments done on CPUs, a CPU switching packets. Instead of processing the 40 protocols that that fast chip is doing, the CPU is usually doing two, L2 and L3. But anyway, the difference is quite startling. In fact, today it's about 80x. Last year it was about 50x. And that difference is still growing. One thing it tells us is that we're not gonna be using CPUs for implementing the fastest switching parts of our network anytime soon. So other domains have solved this problem by designing their own processes. Of course, we know the computer example, but I can remember big fixed function graphics cards, you probably can remember these too, from folks like Sun and DEC and HP. Remember those things? But today, graphics is done in domain-specific processes called GPUs. And I can also remember I'm old enough to remember when signal processing for base stations and video codecs was built using fixed function hardware as well. Today it's done in domain specific processes called digital signal processes or DSPs. So in both cases, the user writes an application in a high level language, what they want the behavior to be, which is compiled down to run on that domain specific processor itself, not on a CPU next to it. With a, and that domain-specific processor can do its job because it has the right instru instruction set and the right model of parallelism. So the same thing is happening now in machine learning as well with a TPU, it's essentially the same, the same approach. This hasn't happened in networking until recently because of that conventional wisdom. Of course, I'm gonna tell you that it's, it's changing, but it's changing for several reasons, not just this specific example. 
in this particular example, it's, the language is P4, an open language, and P0 is an open architecture for a new class of programmable switches. So it's starting to, starting to happen. So a PISA chip consists of a programmable parser followed by a pipeline of identical match and action processing stages that are implementing a small instruction set. And P4 is a language for programming a general class of, of programmable switch devices. So in this model, users write a protocol in this language, P4 for example, and then that is compiled down to run on that domain specific, that domain specific PISA processor. If a better processor comes along, our code should be portable and we should go and run it there instead. So the benefits of programmability in the forwarding plane are probably pretty obvious, right? I don't need to spell them out here. But the thing I do want to make clear is from now on, those programmable devices will have the same speed, power, and cost as the fixed function switch chips. That's why well, you'll see an announcements by several people, Cavi and Barefoot, others, that the fastest switch chips in the world can now be programmed by the users. That's quite a change. So you might be wondering, you might be wondering if this is some kind of flash in the pan. And because I've been spending the last couple of years sort of examining this very close, closely while spending time at Barefoot, I thought I would share with you the things that I've observed that say, actually, I think this change is here to stay. Actually, regardless of any one company or any one chip, I actually think this is a, this, that we're gonna see a pivot, and this is, this is gonna how, how it's gonna be done in the future. So if you look at the fastest switch chips over the years, there's a few things that you can notice, a few properties that you can notice. First, about 30% of the chip area is devoted to serial I.O. That's the area around the outside. And that's even true of the newer, the more recent ones as, as well. This is because with each new generation, Moore's law lets us halve the size of that I.O., but we're greedy, so we want to double its speed, which then cancels out that effect, and they end up having the same area. That's true of the next generation too, and so on. And so serial I.O. has the same area for each generation. 50% of that chip is also devoted to packet processing, and about 20% typically to the packet buffer and uh, traffic management. That packet processing we can split into two. It's equally roughly between the table lookup memory and the logic that's processing the packets. So what happens over successive generations to each of these pieces? So let's first look at the memory that's used for the lookup tables and the packet buffer. It stays the same too, because with each time, we, Moore's law will give us half the area, but then we're greedy. We want bigger lookup tables, we want bigger packet buffers, typically scaling with the capacity, and so it cancels it out, one generation and then the next. So memory stays, stays the same area for each generation. Okay, let's go back to our chip. And this is important. Notice that red portion, the logic. It's the only part of the chip that's actually different between a fixed function and a programmable device. Everything else is the same. The lookup tables, the packet buffer, and the serial I.O. are all unaffected by whether the chip is fixed or programmable. So what happens to that logic? That's what we need to ask. Does it stay the same? No. Because typically, we only add a very small number of protocol features on each successive generation, and that dictates the amount of logic. So maybe 10%. Moore's law shrinks the whole logic, and so we end up with something that gets successively a smaller and smaller fraction, and so the logic area is going down each generation. What does that mean? It means that in each generation, the fraction of the chip that logic is going down, and eventually there's no real difference between fixed function and programmable. There's another reason, too. Programmable chips are easier to design. Why? Because they're more uniform. They're actually much simpler. And they're easier to verify as well. Although the number of protocol only grows about 10% each generation, if you do that over many, many years, it really adds up to a whole boatload of stuff. So whereas about 20 years ago, this might have been the protocols that you had on a switch chip, something like two or maybe three, this is what it looks like today. You can't even see it. Today it needs to support dozens. 
This is a typical set of protocols for a top of rack switch. Um, it's, by the way, it's publicly available if you want to say, take a look. It's getting almost impossible to design a fixed function chip that correctly implements all of those protocols. If you get it wrong, you've got to wait three years for the next one. But if the chip is programmable, you don't have to implement all of those things, because that's a program. The, pro the user comes along later and adds the program to implement all of those things, right? So all of those things that are inside in that little horrible detail of all of those protocols get implemented by the programmer. So it makes for a faster development time, faster verification time, and then easier to change the behavior once it's actually installed. So you can see how switch ships get more uniform as they get more programmable in the following set of pictures. So as we go more programmable from left to right, you can see that it's more compact, more uniform, and it leads to a more efficient design. So as we get more programmable, the cost of design, the cost of verification could potentially go down. The complexity gets pushed off into software. So let me summarize what programmability will give us. First, in terms of chip technology, the difference in chip area and power between programmable fixed function is going away. In terms of the complexity, there are now too many protocols to correctly hard code them in silicon and know that you'll get them right. The chip architecture is, is, is now clearer because the instruction set has become known over the years of, of looking at networks. And we can now make programmable switch chips as fast as fixed ones. It means that new ideas that are created by you, a programmer, are owned by you, the programmer, not by the chip designer. And greater visibility means failures diagnosed faster and fixes that can be developed and deployed more quickly. I like this quote from Ben Horowitz, protocols are being lifted off chips and into software. I think that's the key point. Finally, I'd like to touch on good visibility. Everyone who runs a network, and many of you do, knows how hard it is to see what's going on. We generally have a rough idea of where our packets are going, um, but we're frequently very surprised when we actually look on the wire and see what's there. It's quite different often from what we thought. For example, imagine that you find a packet in a place in the network where it wasn't supposed to be, and you need to figure out why. So you want to ask, which switches did it visit to get that? What rules did it match in each switch? What version of the switch rules tables were present when that packet passed through? Or frequently, we're trying to debug congestion problems. We want to know things like which queue did each switch, which did each switch put our packet in? What was the pre precise occupancy of the, of the queue when my packet showed up? How long did it wait in that queue? And who was it sharing the queue with? If it was encountering congestion, I want to know what all the other packets were in that queue as it passed through. These are all natural questions to ask, and I think that should be available to us, but they're not today. So this would actually be much easier if we can change and program the behavior of the entire network, the control plane and the forwarding plane. So as we move in that direction, this becomes easier. If it's fixed, you have to guess in advance what information the network owner might need to look at. And frankly, a chip designer isn't going to know. Instead, we can write programs to collect the state that we need to and observe. And if we need more information, we just simply change the program and look for more. And as you know, lots of companies are working on, on various types of telemetry and visibility products right, right now. Um, but there are basically two ways to do this. The first is something that, that, that I call uh, packet postcards, in which a switch generates a small timestamp and a small digest of every packet that goes through, sends it to a server that is gonna log it for processing. Benefit of this is that you can replay the network history and uh, the packet sizes don't have to change. A downside is you create a lot of extra traffic in your network. So for example, with a packet postcard, the network is gonna generate a small postcard for every packet and then send it down to a, a bank of servers for analysis. And we've seen various announcements recently for products that basically do this kind of thing. The second approach, um, which is just a different, which would just be a different program for the control and forwarding planes, is called inbound network telemetry, or INT. So the data packets are gonna carry an instruction telling the data path to insert the state that it's looking for into the packet header as it goes by. 
The benefits are we don't need any additional packets. All of the packets become probes, and you can replay the network history based on that information. The downside is you have to expand the packet, so that's the trade-off that, that you would do. So with INT and this approach, packets carry instru instructions that the V switches and the physical switches are going to insert, and they're going to insert information gathered along the way. The information is going to be uh, processed right at the end. So here is the, the, the state being added into that header as we go by. Eventually, we split it off, we send it for analysis, and then the original data packet is intact. Two alternative ways. They both have their trade-offs. We'll see both of them, both of them get widely, widely used, I think. So I'd like to finish by, by, by showing a short demo of how this works, because I want to use it to motivate a, an observation of where this kind of visibility will take us. This particular one is a, sh is a short demo of, of, of INT. So on the left, I'm going to show you a visualization in a moment that matches this picture. That's why I'm going to explain it first. So on, on, on the left and right are racks of servers that are connected in the middle by some spine switches. Initially, there's going to be a, um, some long-lived high-throughput flows, some background, uh, background traffic running, running in the network. So this server over here is going to send a whole load of memcache traffic to the one down in the bottom right-hand corner. But because this is folded, the one in the bottom right-hand corner, when it replies, is replying from over here, right? Just because it's looking at a folded view of the, of the servers. Okay, some parameters. There's gonna be 50 new memcache flows every second. The switches are all using ECMP. There is gonna be this INT instructions. They're gonna ask for data to be inserted into the packets. Um, for Q latency, flow completion time, et cetera. And we know what we're gonna see. ECMP doesn't know about the background traffic. It's gonna encounter peaks, and therefore we'll see some congestion. And we're gonna ask the question, if, if, we can, if we can see where the congestion is, why the hell can't the network, and why can't it fix it? Right? It's obvious to us what's going on. So here's the same setup in the network visualizer now as an animation of, of uh, as a video of this uh, that I took earlier. So here's the long-lived high-throughput flow, and uh, we just started 50 memcache flows per second. Here they, here they go across the network. And um, we can see that the completion time is very unpredictable, and already the 95th percentile is over 100 milliseconds. Kind of sucks, right? We've all seen this problem in networks before. You can see where the top memcache flows are colliding with those high-throughput background TCP flows. What's happening? Well, ECMP is just blindly spreading traffic over all of the links. It's oblivious, it has no idea how to avoid the congestion, it doesn't even know that there's congestion there, that's just how ECMP works. Even though it's very obvious to us what the problem is. Familiar problem, right? We've all seen this kind of thing before. Where you can see, you can see at this level, it's very obvious what's going on. Why the hell doesn't the network fix it? So in the next part, the vSwitch is gonna look at the INT values and it's just gonna make some decision. It says, hey, there's congestion along that path. I'm not gonna use that path. I'm actually gonna twiddle some bits and I'm going to cause the packets to take a different, different path through the network. So it's just congestion aware load balancing. Right? There's many, many ways that you could do, where you could do this. The point is you need visibility and you need control in order for it to fix it. There are a thousand ways to fix it. This is just one way that you could do it. And not surprisingly, the completion times are much more predictable now, as you would expect. The key thing is, this is easy, and it's obvious. And it should be available in any network, in some form or other, maybe not in exactly in this form. Isn't it, it's kind of odd that it, we, we don't have this kind of capability at, uh, today. We shouldn't need for it to be baked into silicon. In fact, one great thing about a programmable network is that each of these methods is now just a program. You can pick and customize your network so you can see whatever you need. And as we just saw, in future, we can reasonably expect the network to automatically detect and correct those errors for us, eventually, eventually. And so, in summary, next dream. In the future, good abstractions. Good abstractions, I think these will let us verify correct behavior across boundaries. And I think that it will also help us automatically generate tests and do the verification for us. Good programmability at all levels, at the top, all the way down to the bottom, 
it will let us program network top down instead of bottoms up. And we'll be able to add the monitoring and the telemetry that we need in order to make the network work. This will breed good visibility. Good visibility means we'll be able to identify errors and performance problems much, much more quickly. We'll be able to log, replay, and analyze our network as we see fit. So what if we got all of those three? What next? Well, of course, what we'd really like to do is to get all of this right so then we can really start to have more autonomous control over our network. And in fact, with those three pieces, of course, that's where we'd be heading. If we can have that autonomous control in, the, in, in, in our network, then maybe all of you can get some rest and we can all go and do something different. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. We have time for a few minutes of questions if people would like to ask them um, and just uh, speak loud, I think. I can't see you, so you better Okay, all right, so, I'll, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll say the gentleman in the green shirt is standing up, why don't you go? That's a great question. Yeah, I didn't have time to talk about that. So the, um, you know, before GPUs came along, there were things that had names that were very much like GPUs. Um, but instead of somebody figuring out what the right instruction set was and figuring out the right amount of parallelism, they just took a whole load of risk cores and threw them on a piece of silicon. Then the GPU came along and someone said, no, 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 no. What you need is the primitive instruction set that you need in order to be able to process graphics and then the right model of parallelism within the chip to be able to do graphical operations. The same thing happened in networking. Most early NPUs were, in fact, a bunch of risk cores. I just call that lazy. Really, the right thing to do is to say, what are the primitive operations in networking? They're things like add bits to header, twiddle bits, decrement of value, add more bits for encapsulation, remove them from decapsulation. There's about 11 instructions that you need. Once you've got those 11 instructions implemented in a domain-specific processor, then you can figure out the parallelism. Well, what is the parallelism that's present in, a, in, in packet processing? There's an extraordinary amount of parallelism that you can exploit. All of the packets from different ports going to different ports. All of the different protocols that are not, don't have any serial dependency. Well, it turns out there's very little serial dependency between different protocols. That's because they were designed that way to be orthogonal. So there's a little serial dependency. There's a little bit in the older protocols, but nowadays the newer protocols don't have much. So there's a huge opportunity for parallelism that you can do all at the same time if you design the, 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 the beast to do it. So that's why stepping back and saying, what is the domain-specific processor optimized for this type of packet processing leads a much more efficient and a, and a, and a much faster type of, uh, of design. And the term NPU had already gone. <laughs> Qu question here in the back. Can you see me? Oh, yeah. Hi. My name is Simone. I'm CTO at Mosaicsoft. Uh, I have a question on the first of those two proposals that you had almost at the end of your slides. OK. I was wondering if. If you tried to do that, you would have the issue of synchronizing different switches to make sure that those timestamps will be accurate, Perhaps, especially yep. in a high performance network. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, um, as you probably know, there's been big advances in, in the ability to synchronize, synchronize time. Um, and uh, you know, people have now reported in, definitely in the, in the order of small numbers of microseconds for, 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 for doing this. Um, you know, in both, both approaches, you want to have some idea of time. In the first one, you ideally would have a global, global notion of time. In the second one, perhaps you can do it relative. Um, but I don't think it's going to be a big distinguishing feature between the two. I think we're heading definitely in the right direction. Again, there's nothing magical about time synchronization between different switches. It's just kind of surprising that it took long, so long for it to be there. And now that it's there, I think that we're just going to see it get it more and more precise. Um, I think Ken. Yeah. Hey, Ken. Hey, Nick, I'm curious. You talk about users programming switches. Oh, uh, yeah. I was wondering if you could kind of map that to the industry in terms of if you've got chip makers, network software makers, yeah. network hardware makers, a lot of different players in industry. Yeah. What do you imagine are the users who are actually writing P4 programs being loaded into uh, actual, uh, not NPUs, whatever the correct term is for the new generation? 
No, it's a great question. Um, although I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I can take the fifth because I'm an academic. I don't know anything about the industry structure, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, no, <laughs> let me ask you a question. So, I, you know, I, I use this example. Um, I, I, I thought long and hard about this. You know, there are many ways that you could describe the forwarding behavior when in a switch, just like there are many ways that you could describe a control plane, whether you use C, C, Java, or whatever, right? There's nothing magical about any one language. There's just, the, it's just a language. The question is, and I think your question is, in whose hands is that language and that ability to program? Clearly, people who make equipment, very important, right? And so in that sense, the user, just like that you're user of a lot of software tools in order to design the software that runs on a box, so you should be able to do that further, further down. If I'm a, running a big web-scale data center, clearly, I'm already writing the software to control my device. It's just natural that I would expen extend that down to have a behavior that I want in my network, which is specific to my environment. If I've got hundreds of thousands of servers in a data center, I know what I need much better than somebody else does, right? So in those, both of those cases, it's pretty obvious who the user is. It's whoever is actually doing that program. But I think there's an interesting possibility here. Right? Actually, a couple of interesting possibilities. One is, I'd like to be able to expose that to the students in my class, right? So that they can then change the behavior in ways that they can do research and learn and probe in ways that they haven't been able to do before. I think the challenge for the, um, those who build equipment for others is gonna be how to expose that safely and meaningfully to the, 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 the person that has to keep a large network running. My guess is that we're years away from being able to get across that sort of chasm of being able to do it, just as it's taken years to expose programmability of the data, of the, for, of the control plane, I'm sorry, of the control plane to the, but, but that's happening now, right? You can now take, I can put my program onto a box and then expect it to have a, have a behavior. I don't think it should be surprising that I could then have that change the way that the forwarding takes place as well. Whether I write it as the end user or you write it for me, doesn't, doesn't, matter, doesn't matter a big deal. But if you think about it on the graphics, when I load a program on my laptop, it changes the graphics, it's, its GPU code is running differently, right? And so it's just part and parcel of changing the behavior of the, of the system. Beautifully timed. Uh, Thank you. To, so we've just run out of time for questions, but uh, Nick, you're staying around for a while? I think sure. Do you I'll be, be able to catch him at the breaks? Um, so another, another thank you for Nick.